My name is Lysia Heath. I'm the CEO of Women for Election Australia. Uh, and we exist to inspire and equip more women to run for public office in Australia. And we do that through nonpartisan training forums. We love to run these monthly in conversations with current or retired uh, female politicians because we like to shine a light on the positives of being enrolled uh, involved with politics. We, we all feel very informed about the negatives of politics, <laughs> but what about the positives? What can you achieve when you're, when you're involved? Like, let me pause there for just a moment because uh, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'm coming to you from the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Aora Nation and Sydney's eastern beaches, and I would like to acknowledge leaders past, present and emerging. I would also like to say that sovereignty of this land was never ceded, mm -hmm. and it's my belief that until we mm -hmm. reach a treaty with First Nations people that uh, it's compromised in terms of being able to move forward in mm -hmm. harmony. So, without further ado, let me welcome formally Kelly O'Dwyer to the call, who's joining us from, from Melbourne, not locked down. <laughs> um, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Um, really appreciate you taking the time, Kelly. There's, there's a lot that I want to touch on and how we'll, we'll have a, a, a conversation, talk about your involvement with politics, your journey and, and the positives that came from, from being involved. And then um, we'll have a few questions from our alumni as well. But look, let's, let's start where we often start with these interviews, which is your journey into politics. Um, you, you had a career before politics. You were a solicitor. You worked with one of the big four banks. You were a political advisor before. Uh, you, you got elected in the federal election uh, in 2009, is that right? Yes, a by-election actually. It was in the by-election. By by-election in the seat of Higgins. Mm -hmm. uh, so take us back to the months preceding that. Had you been a long-time member of the Liberal Party, short-time member? Had you tried for pre-selection before? You know, it's always nice to, to hear that story because it's different for everybody. So take us back there. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Lucia, and, and to, to all of um, the participants in the program that you're running. Firstly, can I congratulate you for what you're doing to engender, um, you know, additional skills, insights and, and leadership for those people who are wanting to put their hands up for election. And this is the reason I'm participating is because I so, so strongly want to encourage that no matter what your political stripes, although I hope there are a few people there who, who sort of back the horse that I do. But um, I just want to say, you know, it's, it's critically important that we do get uh, really talented women putting their hands up for election because they can make such a significant difference in the nation's parliament. So I'll start by saying that. Um, to your first question, uh, Lysia, um, you know, was I involved in the party before uh, I, I put my hand up for pre-selection? Uh, the short answer is yes. Yes, I was. My, um, my parents, you know, when I was growing up were not were not political people, but they certainly were people who liked discussing, if you can hear a siren going in the background, I really apologise. Somebody's alarm has gone off. So if you can hear it, I really I apologise for that. It come through any time, Kelly. It's all oh, right. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, so it's reminding me of the bells of Parliament House. So it's very, uh, it's very reminiscent. Um, they weren't political people, um, but they did discuss the issues of the day. So I always had a really strong interest in what was going on and why it was going on. And we discussed that each night at the dinner table. But I suppose for me, my real political awakening would have come when I was in about year 10. And it was around the time my parents had a small business. Uh, the business did not do well um, at, at a time that Victoria was experiencing uh, a recession. Uh, you might remember there was the collapse of the Pyramid Building Society, problems with the State Bank in Victoria. And, you know, it did bring home to me that um, the decisions that are made a long way away uh, in the nation's parliament or in the state parliament can actually have a big impact on people's daily lives. And so I probably became a lot more interested in politics at that point. And there are things that I agreed with at that time and things that I didn't. And, but I, 
I sort of made a resolution that when I had the opportunity to become more actively engaged, I'd do that. And I had that opportunity when I got to university. I can remember my father saying to me as I trotted off to OWEC, um, he shouted out two things to me. The first was, it's not too late. You don't have to do law. You know, I think my, my father was actually a frustrated engineer and he'd done law and thought that this was a very bad career move. And the second thing he said was, do not get involved in student politics. So it's very lucky he didn't shout out something else <laughs> because that was clearly my, my youthful rebellion. I did both. Um, and I got involved in the Liberal Club uh, on campus at university. It wasn't formally affiliated with the Liberal Party, but it certainly was an entree into discussing um, a number of these ideas. And, and it was certainly a very contested forum as well because there were student elections, people put forward different ideas, and you had to be able to robustly defend your point of view. And I suppose one of the things I learned from that experience was that whilst you know, people might not agree with the position that you take, so long as you're prepared to stand up, articulate your point of view, give sensible reasons why, um, you know, you have an opportunity to at least try and persuade them. And so, um, and so from that point on, uh, I became quite involved in the Liberal Party. Um, and, you know, just to explain sort of how I moved from point to point, because I think a lot of people sort of don't understand how these mechanics work, depending on who you are and how you've been involved. But, um, you know, I, I worked as a, you know, as a lawyer, um, but I was involved in the Liberal Party um, after hours. And so I got myself elected to the Administrative Committee, which is the governing body of the Liberal Party in Victoria. Uh, and um, as a result, you know, of that, you know, I came into contact, I suppose, with a few different people. And when an opportunity came up to work in Peter Costello's office, um, I, I was telephoned by someone who said, I put your name on a list. And I only found out later on that it was a very long list of people <laughs> who were being interviewed for the job. And, and, and I did get it. Um, and it was because of my legal background and experience that um, I had the opportunity to work with him. Right, okay, so you you only ran once for pre-selection then? So it was that... I, was oh yes, I only ran once for pre-selection. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's really interesting because I, I certainly know um, in the past, you know, a lot of people took many, many goes, you know, to run for, for pre-selection. And that still sometimes does happen. Uh, although I think it is less frequent, well, certainly, you know, on my side of politics and in the state of Victoria, which is the experience that I can talk from. Um, I, I only ran once. Um, the, the, I, it, it had never sort of been my ambition from, you know, um, a, a young thing to, to be running for parliament. But certainly um, as I got older, uh, I was always very interested in policy and I recognised that if I was going to be able to truly shape policy in the way that I wanted to, I was going to have to put my hand up and, and that meant I was going to have to run. Yep. Oh, look, I mean, it rings true with so many messages that we give in our courses in terms of there's only, you know, we advocating for, for outcomes is fantastic and marching on Canberra has a role to play, but there's, there's only so much you can achieve doing that versus, um, you know, being actually at the table where, where policy is, is um, debated and produced. So did you enter... Did you enter politics wanting to prosecute on particular policies? Did you have a bee in your bonnet or something that particular, particularly drove you that you wanted to change? Well, look, I, I was always very interested in economic policy because, um, I mean, I was always very interested uh, both, you know, from the perspective of the opportunities you have as a nation, but also the individual opportunities that you have. Um, and I suppose I was very much shaped by my, my mother in that. Um, my my mum was probably what you'd describe as a, a great 1970s feminist mother. And, you know, one of her earliest pieces of advice I re can recall to me was make sure that you are financially and economically independent because if you are, you will be able to have choices in your life. And so, you know, that, that, that was always for me, you know, part of the thinking uh, around not only for myself, but, but for others, you know, how, how can you actually provide 
more opportunities for people um, so that they can live their, their best lives. And economic policy for me was a great driver of that. Um, it's very interesting that you bring that up. Uh, and I, I told you that I might bring this up today, but about having economic background, because I spoke to the former head of the Office of Women, Trish Bergen, uh, mm -hmm. late last week and, and mentioned that we were having this interview this week. And Trish was very glowing of your time as, as Minister for Women. And she said, make sure that you mention that she, you know, she had an economic background in terms of, you know, coming into the Ministry for Women and, and make sure that you mention, um, you know, that she was the first Minister for Women on the Expenditure Review Committee and make sure that you mention, you know, this, um, you know, that you were responsible for, for the 2018, you know, the inaugural Women's Economic Security Statement as well. Um, there's a lot of legacy in that, <laughs> Kelly, like, did you appreciate that at the time? Like, I've skipped forward a little bit. You were backbencher. You weren't a minister straight away, but, yeah. but did, on reflection, so I, I so, so I suppose um, what what I recognised, you know, when when I went into parliament, is that um, you've got to be pretty clear on on a couple of things that you want to be able to do and achieve while you're there, because. You know, you may be there for a short time, you may be there for a longer time, but the amount of time that you're there, you need to utilise as effectively as possible. And um, when I became Minister for Women, I'd also been Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. And I sort of felt at that time um, that as well as women's issues had, had been done and, you know, superbly by, you know, women of um, different political colours, um, I, I did feel that, um, you know, there was, a, you know, quite rightly a very strong focus to, around domestic violence and women's safety and all of those things. But frankly, you know, I, I, I sort of feel that we have to do that, you know, as a baseline, you know, that is something that should be, you know, demanded and that we should aspire to, to even greater things for women and to provide all women with economic opportunities to be able to live their best lives and make the best choices for themselves and, and for their families and be able to be financially secure um, or build that financial security for their future. And so, you know, I wanted to reposition, I suppose, you know, the, the women's agenda and, and marry it with a bit of an economic lens so that people understood some of these issues that I think people had long thought were you know, let's be nice to women's issues, for instance, sexual harassment, which is how I think traditionally a lot of people, particularly men, have viewed that issue. I wanted them to see it with an economic lens and actually understand there are economic repercussions that actually flow from this sort of behaviour. And it's it, it doesn't just harm the individual woman themselves, their families and their communities and their workplace, but it actually harms the nation if you get this stuff wrong, because you are potentially not drawing on the full talent pool that you have um, to be able to, you know, progress um, not only, you know, the, the economic opportunity of the nation, but, but just, you know, the, the innovation, the, the whole agenda. Well, I think, you know, I think that um, it's a fabulous legacy. And I know you worked closely with Kate Jenkins as well in terms of what, what ultimately became the um, Respect at Work inquiry that went around the country. So um, I think this that time, honestly, Kelly, will be something that will be looked back as, as quite a, a stake in the ground moment in terms of policy and how things are measured, knowing that things need to be measured to be, to be managed. Um, and I suspect we're going to have a few questions about that further, but I want to move on a little bit in terms of your journey because you you, you got elected, it was in the by-election, you, you managed to get elected in the general election not much, not much further on. How was your time spent in terms of broken up between Canberra and, and your electorate? How much time at each that would have shifted through your political career? But what is it that you enjoyed the most being out in your electorate yeah well I think I think you would not go into politics if you didn't like people you know and I love I love meeting people and I love 
hearing their stories and listening to their challenges. And, and to be honest, one of the greatest things I think about being a local member is that you get to share both the best times in people's lives and, you know, you, you sometimes get insights into some of the most challenging times as well. And I think with that comes a great responsibility. Um, and so, you know, for me, that was, that was definitely a, a highlight. Um, I suppose when I first got elected, um, you know, I mean, you, you spend like all your time in your electorate and you fly to Canberra and do the things that you need to do up there and you come back to your electorate. Um, and, and to be honest, that didn't change, you know, even when I was a minister but you become a lot more efficient in terms of how you actually use your time and how you can triage things. So um, as your staff develop as well, because you develop a team around you, um, they become much better at being able to fix issues before they need to sort of come to you um, so that you're really only dealing with the really challenging things that, that require your attention. So um, I suppose you just get get better at doing it but you spend I mean I think people who are good members of parliament you know spend a lot of time connected to their local community um, and that's not to say that they should simply be a cipher for everything that you know their local community says because I think you know why bother elect somebody if you don't want them to apply their independent sort of judgment to various different sorts of issues but I think you've you've, you've got to be in touch with what's going on and what people are saying thinking and feeling. Well, it, to that end then, I mean, people uh, on this call, the women that attend our courses, you know, some are focused at, at getting elected at a local level or a state or, or federal or, or maybe Senate. You know, it depends what policy interest you have, what level of government you then focus on and, and so forth. Within a federal electorate, you obviously have a state member, maybe two state members, maybe three. It depends on the size. And then you have councils as well. Again, maybe multiple um, how much interaction would yeah. you have at those different levels? So I, I always tried to be very collaborative in, in my approach. Um, and, you know, if, if there were issues that we could work on together, you know, to solve a particular community problem, then, you know, that's, that's something that, that I thought we should do. Um, having said that, um, I mean, different, different parliamentarians do this differently, but... But whenever somebody came through my door, um, my view was whether it's a state, federal, local government issue or, or something entirely sort of separate, if they're coming to me, then they want me to help them to navigate, you know, the system. So I'm not going to be palming them off to whoever it is that they need to speak to. We're going to try and help help them navigate the system to solve for whatever issue it is or at least try and get them close to being able to solve for it. Um, and I know that different people, you know, have a different way of, of dealing with that, but I sort of saw my office very much as a one-stop one -stop shop. Okay. Well, now we're going to jettison back to Canberra. <laughs> I said we'd be pinging all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so in Canberra, I've had the opportunity to, to go there a few times in the last um, year. I still get lost in Parliament House. I'm not going to lie. Um, Don't worry. What, what you must not do is navigate according to the artwork around the walls because that changes every okay. every couple of weeks or something. So don't orientate yourself that way. That tip has come a bit late. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of in terms of you, you have party commitments when you're in Canberra, party mm -hmm. meetings. Obviously, you'll be in the chamber in the House of Reps. What is the opportunity for you to meet other women cross-party in Canberra? Certainly it's a piece of research we've been focused on in recent times that in the OECD, Australia is the only, only country that doesn't have a formal cross-party women's caucus or for alliance, whatever you'd call it. So what were the opportunities for you to actually um, meet with each other? Yeah, so, I mean, you do, you're, I mean, people, I think, can't quite conceive of just how busy the days can be in Canberra because they do a lot of negative <laughs> publicity about, you know, all sorts of goings on. But, um, but, but those that are sort of there and there to work and do stuff, I mean, you know, you, you're pretty busy from the moment you get in. And I was usually in by sort of 6.30 in the morning till the moment you leave, and that can be sort of at 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, I actually found 
the great opportunity to be able to work with women uh, you know, across party lines on, on two issues in particular. Um, one of the one of the issues I had when I was a backbencher, you know, came to me from a constituent who was a researcher, a scientist, um, who was not able to actually apply for a particular fellowship because um, she wanted to apply part time because she had some caring responsibilities. And, you know, she was complaining to me about this fact and she said, you know, I can apply full time and go part time, but I can't actually apply part time. They'll just knock out my application. And it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And we weren't in government at the time. I, I wrote to the relevant minister, didn't receive a great response, you know, or it didn't make a lot of sense, followed up, still didn't think it was great ended up calling another new member of parliament um, from across the aisle, Amanda Rishworth. And I said to her, look, you know, it doesn't sort of strike me that this is very sensible. And, you know, I reckon we could actually shine a bit of a light on this and other issues to do with women in some of these male dominated professions. So we formed women in math, science and engineering with me. Um, and I came to be interviewed actually sometime later um, on this particular gendered parliamentary group because you know there are too many of them around the world in, in a number of these western democracies according to the researcher who was doing the research at the time and we we would host different events to actually shine a light to look at what the barriers were and what we could do to solve for it and I'm happy to say we were able to fix that issue so that you know the, these young particularly female, although there are men with caring responsibilities, but at this time it seemed to be, you know, actively discriminating against women and there was no need for that barrier to exist. So we happily helped get rid of it. Okay, well, we love hearing these stories and it's one of the reasons I ask because, you know, state politicians we've, we've interviewed, federal politicians, you know, we have a cross-party women's WhatsApp group, um, yes, we do catch up at different times. Sometimes when something gets blocked, we get together and work out how to unblock it. You know, these are, those are wonderful. They're very positive things to hear and, and it helps offset what I was talking about before, which is what we always hear, which is the negatives. But Well, I can give you another example as well. I mean, one, one of the uniquely women's diseases is, of course, ovarian cancer. And, um, and you know, when... You know, I was sort of thinking about, well, how, how can we, again, shine a light on this and actually use the platform that we have to, to make more and more women aware? I realised, well, look, we can do it through Parliament, but also there are a whole heap of women in the media at, at, um, at Parliament House as well who also would like to use the platform that they have. And so Sarah Hanson-Young, myself and Gabe Brockman from the Labor Party, um, each year would host along with Sabra Lane um, an event at Parliament House to talk about these issues with ovarian cancer. And, and there are stories around how people were informed at those events of some of these symptoms and through the, you know, the um, platforms that we're able to provide who happily, you know, were, were able to, to, to understand what was going on with them, you know, before things became too far progressed. Um. I'm not sure you could give us more examples, but that's, again, that's just a, another example of, you know, what can be achieved. And obviously what we're trying to achieve is uh, assisting more women to get in, not just in Canberra, but at all levels, so that you can be flanked by more women when those decisions need to be happen. And, and, and obviously that's going to be make a big difference. So, so you established in your time, I think it was, was it in 2018 you established the Enid Lions Fund? Oh, yeah, the Fighting Fund. Yeah, that's right. And it, to provide more financial support to women um, who wanted to run for the Liberal Party, um, not just for pre-selection, but, but to run as well, run um, including in marginal seats, which is very important. Why, why then? Why was establishing the fund so important to you? Why did it happen in 2018? And you know, what have been the successes so far? So I, you know, and, and I mean, this is a broader point around, you know, elections and fundraising and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, but in the system that we have today, um, the system, you know, basically says you've got to fund your own election campaign. 
some support you know comes from the party but but often um, you, you need to be able to to raise funds to to run your election campaigns um, and you need to be able to to do that with the confidence that you would be able to actually run a, a decent campaign um, and you know it struck me that one of the one of the again the barriers because I'm all about well what's the problem and rather than admire the problem how do we try and solve for the problem because we can all admire a problem but you know it, it actually you know you might not have the full solution but at least what can you do to sort of chip away at it and and I realized that you know for, for a lot of women particularly um, it's a big risk to put your hand up for, for election and uh you're often very concerned about um, not only your own personal income, and, and we certainly didn't cover that, um, but, but being able to actually then run the campaign and run it effectively so you give yourself the very best chance uh, in that election, you know, is, is a real challenge and, and can, in fact, be a bit of a distraction from the main, from the main game of, of getting out there and, and winning votes. So um, whilst, you know, um, they weren't huge sums of money, um, uh, I, I mean, I spoke to a number of my cabinet colleagues and particularly Julie Bishop, um, she put in a significant amount of money as well. And we were able to, in consultation with the federal director, determine, you know, the best use of that money um, for the, the women who are actually standing at that election in, um, in 2019. And has it been used since 2019 or... Um... Well, well, we have funds, are being, funds are still being raised. Yep. Um, I mean, it was fully distributed at that time. Okay. So, so yeah, so un unfortunately it's not so huge that there's a massive corpus um, and in an ideal world, you know, that would be lovely. That would be lovely to have. Um, but, um, but that's not the case here. But you've got to, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. And I, I know that, um, you know, a little bit of money at the right time can actually make quite a big difference in the oh. campaign. Absolutely. It's a, we focus on fundraising in our training, you know, the obligations of it and how you advocate for yourself. Um, and I've got to say, it is one of the um, bits that you see our, our attendees almost physically recoil at in our course. Like I can fundraise for everyone, the hospital, the school, um, but when it's asking for myself, sometimes there's a block. Um, so we train about how to get out of your own way <laughs> in order to, you know, fundraise effectively because it is a key part of success. Yes. Um, so let's move on then to we've seen in talking about pre-selection, you know, we're focusing on the federal level right now, but um, we have a number of women on this call who have run for Liberal pre-selection before, um, and we have women from all parties on this call, but uh, we, we get particularly frustrated, not gonna lie, uh, when we see extraordinary effort being put in by parties to, to get a wonderful suite um, of candidates for pre-selection. And we saw it um, most recently um, up in Queensland in the seat of Barton, have I got the right seat there, um, uh, where five women and one man were running in the pre-selection for the Liberal seat and the man ended up getting winning pre-selection. Um, it happened in the seat of Sturt as well. Um, how, can we, how can we make sure that, that that doesn't continue to happen? Because we can only get more women into, into Canberra when if a man steps down, they're replaced by a woman. <laughs> it's a simple mathematical equation. <laughs> uh, well, look, I, I, I won't comment on on recent pre selections because you know I'm I'm, I'm sort of out of that, I'm out of that scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but um, but but look, I think I think it is important that um, well, certainly in my seat, you know, I, I was replaced by another woman. I replaced a man. Um, yep. And I was replaced by um, another woman. Uh, I Katie think Allen. it's yep. important. Yeah, Katie Allen. Yeah, it's important to actually have a, a really strong focus on, you know, the different strengths that you actually need in a team. And politics is all about getting the right sort of skill set you know, into the parliament. And you don't want everybody to be exactly the same, whether they're men or 
women. Yes. So um, I, I do think that you, you need to be clear that you actually aspire to, to have more women in the parliament. Um, I've, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what I've previously said. I've, I've, I've long advocated for targets with accountability. Now, you can call that what you like. Um, some people call it quotas, other people, you know, I mean, you know, everyone will give it its own label. Um, it is it is always challenging, you know, in, in party organisations, and I think this has been true um, for the Labor Party as well, you know, where it is democratic, you know, to you can't sort of say, or it's very challenging to say for this one seat that might only come up, you know, once every 20 odd years, you know, you must have either this gender or that gender. Um, so you have to think of some innovative ways around it. And I think there are some solutions, you know, around that, but, um, but you need the will to sort of, to, to work through those challenges. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think it is a challenge for, for, for all parties. Absolutely. And, um, you can, it's only the members in that seat that, that get to vote at the end of the day. So, um, you know, when we see those outcomes of, um, because I know how much effort goes into finding those amazing women to run in those seats, including um, using us as a pipeline. So, um, but some on average, on average, it takes three cracks to get elected. That's a message that we put out consistently. Um, and anyone who watched Ms. Represented last night on, on ABC saw Julia Gillard saying she had three cracks at pre-selection. I think... Um, Roman Bishop said it was even more than that. So um, we can't be deterred at the first hurdle in that respect either um, because the data says it takes more than once. <laughs> so <laughs> I, think, I think one of the, I mean, one thing I would say is, you know, if you're coming in completely cold to a political party, you know, it, it will be more challenging because you, you don't know as many people. And it's like any organisation, um, if people know you and know the attributes that you would bring, um, it is it is easier, um, you you know, for them to be persuaded um, to support you. Having said that, I mean there are lots of other things that go on in political parties, um, you know, that 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 might um, provide you know issues for for people as they're standing. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. you. Should you you need to be resilient. <laughs> And you need to be persistent. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Both of those things. Look, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I see some questions have already been posed in in the chat box. So we'll go to some questions shortly. But I think something that Women for Election are doing, Kelly, is is collecting testimonials from um, retired female politicians, and we're running a looks like a politician campaign as well. Again, to shine a positive light on people's experiences in politics. Um, you know, maybe they were the hardest years of someone's life, but they'd go back in a heartbeat, for example, is one of the testimonials that, that we've got. So if there was one thing that you wanted to leave with, with our alumni joining us today about their future careers or taking first steps, what would it be? I would say... Um... Be bold, be courageous, and be you. You know, I think I think sometimes people have this idea that you need to fit into a particular mould, and and often people are told, you know, you need to fit into a particular mould. But I actually think the people who are most effective are those people who are authentic, um, because you know, that you come from a position of strength. Then. So, um, you know, I would say, I would say, yeah, be, be bold, be courageous and, and be you. All right. Well, I love that. Thank you. Yep, that authenticity is a very big part, again, of um, what gets people elected. So, um, so I'm going to go to some questions in the chat box now, Kelly. So the, there's one here from Julie, Julie Gelman. Thanks, Julie. How did you prepare and position for a ministerial role? Ah, so that's a great question, Julie. Um, so it's, 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 very, it's very opaque, you know, to get into the ministry is, uh, you know, it, it is a gift of the Prime Minister. 
and uh, and so um, most members of parliament um, try and sort of find some brilliant formula <laughs> by which they can guarantee themselves a ministry, but they, you know it tends not quite to work that way um, because when prime ministers are thinking about these sorts of things, they're often thinking of not only sort of the skill set but geographic spread and you know how long people have been there for so i think you have to in certain cases you know almost force your way in yes. and um and so for me you know i had a, a, a few areas you know i was pretty interested in and as i mentioned i, I was very interested in in economic issues and so i i, I campaigned to be on the economics committee I ultimately chaired the House Standard Committee on Economics and I persuaded the Treasurer that he should let me um, have terms of reference that would allow me to do a, a, a big report into foreign investment into residential real estate. And, you know, that did provide me with a, a platform to be able to demonstrate, um, you know, my grasp of a number of these policy issues. Whether that was a defining issue, I don't know, but... But certainly it was, it was, you know, one of the parts that I took and, and ultimately I was invited to be Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer. Yeah, well, that's, that's amazing to hear. So advocating for yourself is a key component. Oh, well, yes, and demonstrating. I suppose, you know, I wasn't sort of, um, I mean, I think it's very challenging for, for women. I, I, did, I did at one point, somebody sort of gave me advice, you should speak to some senior colleagues and, you know, get their advice on what it is that you need to do. And, and I recall calling one more, more senior male and who was then a cabinet minister. Um, and I said, oh, you know, I, I'm very keen to join the ministry. Here's why. And this is what I think I could add value on. And, you know, he said, he said to me, you're very ambitious. But he didn't say it in a good way. <laughs> so, that was brought up last night in the... Uh, oh, and well, saying, you know, nobody wants to be pinned, sorry, <laughs> no woman wants to be pinned with the ambitious tag. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I didn't realise that it was such a term of, um, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was clearly not, not a good thing in, in his eyes. So, um, yeah, so I, I ended up just, just working, working hard and trying to sort of demonstrate that I'd be able to make a contribution. Yeah, well, fabulous. Well, it worked. <laughs> um, so next question is from Alyssa. Uh, is there something you were surprised by when you were first elected that you didn't see coming but wish you'd known? Um, I think probably more from a personal perspective. Um, when, when you first become a Member of Parliament, you know, you have your own office. And I'd worked in a lot of other professional environments you know I've worked in big national law firm you know I've worked um, in a bank I've worked in politics and um, and and so I I always assumed that everybody sort of knew how to operate at a particular level <laughs> and I suppose I know it sounds so naive but my my biggest um, learning early on was oh my goodness I'm actually going to have to really break it down for everybody in terms of what it is that they need to do and how they need to do it, and you know, and uh, and 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 that was a little bit of a an adjustment, I suppose, um, for me. But but once I once I grasped that, you know, we you know we we were able to do really really well. But um, that was probably the most unexpected thing that yeah. that I, I, I didn't realise, um, you know, which is pretty obvious. Well, that's good to hear that that was the most unexpected thing. But um, you know, thank you for sharing with it. All the same. Uh, I've got a question from Amy. It says, I think a lot of women are feeling pretty discouraged, maybe even frightened by what's been coming out um, about women's treatment in Canberra. What needs to happen to encourage us and assure us that our safety and well-being will actually be safeguarded if we do enter into that? And there's a little PS here. Uh, PS, I was in the same class as you at PLC, Kelly. Oh, there you go. Small world. <laughs> So look, I think um, I think every workplace, whether it's Canberra, whether it's somewhere completely different, you know, ought to be ought to be safe. And you know, that was the whole point of the work um, 
that that I announced with Kate in, in terms of you know sexual harassment, you know, which was very much the focus of that work. Um, and so, you know, will, will workplaces always be 100% of the time safe? Well, workplaces are made up of individuals. Um, and, you know, you, you can't give a 100% guarantee that everyone's going to behave appropriately at all times. Um, but, but you can certainly put in place the right sort of processes so that, you know, if people don't behave as they should, that there is definitely sanction for that behaviour and that it is not accepted and not tolerated. So I think, you know, um, there is definitely a much greater awareness um, of these issues across the board. And, and I think that that can only lead to much better outcomes for everyone. Having said that, um, uh, you know, I, I must say when, when I heard the allegations that, that were raised, um, I was truly shocked by them, you know. Um, so, I mean, uh, some people say they weren't. I mean, I, I genuinely was very, very shocked to hear them. And and, um, and so, so I think um, as well, you know, being able to shine a light on some of these experiences is also very important. So, so people are aware of some of the things that might be happening that, um, that, that are subterranean. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was shocking. And, um, and you're right in terms of your, your evidence of trying to make that better is, is on the table. You have a proof statement of um, doing the work that you did with Kate Jenkins. I have a couple more questions here and then uh, I promised that I would let you go at a reasonable time um, from um, oh, B Knight. So, uh, Kelly, what impact do you think age has on the ability for a candidate to get pre-selected? I think that's also a really good question. I, I have long found this a very perplexing thing about pre-selections and that is... You know, I, I have seen, you know, a girlfriend of mine um, when I was a party member um, go through a pre-selection. She was newly married at the time and um, didn't have any children. She was up against, she, I think she was the only woman running at that time, a, a whole heap of blokes, um, several of whom actually had not just children but very young children. And she was the only one in that pre-selection. This is many years ago, I hasten to add. She was the only one in that pre-selection who was actually asked about children, despite not having any. <laughs> and, not be, you know, and it was so bizarre. So she was sort of in the minds of those pre-selectors at that time too young. And, and you'll often also hear stories about, you know, women who are told, well, gosh, you're, you're actually, you're now too old. <laughs> you know, to run so I'm yet to find that perfect age where you're just right you know like Goldilocks to, to run for free section so my view is you've got to I mean if it's the right time for you to run if the opportunity you know like for you if it's the right time if you feel that you can make a contribution and you've got something to offer then you've got to back yourself to persuade people yep uh thoroughly endorse that um backing yourself there is no perfect age just just step forward is the is the and come and you know we can help you with with the confidence and the skill sets and the tangible skills that you need um that then make you feel more able to step forward into into that scenario as well uh a question from julie as minister for women how did you go about ensuring that all policies not just those to do with women and children, took into account women's lived experience? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and I think, I mean, certainly um, I had long advocated for um, there to be a much greater engagement and financial capability in the office for women so that it could be utilised much more readily in the budget process Yep. Um, because it struck me that um, there, there was a perspective that was not being, well, you know, there wasn't sort of the capability that had been built in, in the office for women on that specific 
you know, skill set. There was fantastic capability around advocacy and, you know, but in terms of actually being able to, to go toe to toe on ERC papers, you know, which is what you need, you needed people with a finance background who could actually do that. And that was one of the things that, that I advocated for, that we would actually get people with that capability within the Office for Women so that they could be, um, so that their influence could be a lot more than what it was. You know, I felt that it was pretty siloed and that it could in fact be far more extensive um, if, if properly harnessed. Yeah. And so, you know, I was in the, in the process of um, doing all of that. And, and of course, along comes elections. <laughs> Well, that's how we get people elected apart from anything else. But, yes, I know if you're mid, mid-project, mid it could be. Well, it's, it's politics is like a never-ending piece of string. You're never, you're never fully finished. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question we've got, Kelly, from Kim. What advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your political career? Um, what advice? Um, I... Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think I would probably say, uh, don't, I mean, don't, don't, don't think, don't believe people who say to you that you you need to follow a particular course. You know, a, a, you know that you can't get to this point unless you've done you know, these twenty five things, because you know. That, that's just their way of keeping you busy while they, <laughs> they go on and, you know, pursue pursue their path. So I think uh, the advice I would give, I mean, I, I've always run my own race, but, but, but I suppose don't get distracted from running your own race. Certainly seek advice, take, take on board the wisdom of others, make your own decisions and run your own race. I love that advice. Following your own gut instinct, um, you know, is is something that we try to train as well, but it's not anyone else's race. <laughs> so many competent women that are interested in pursuing political careers, uh, what's given them success in their previous career is what will give them success in a political career as well. So, so back yourself in, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, now, Kelly, I absolutely promised we'd have this all done in <laughs> So uh, we're banging right up on that again. If everybody could take the opportunity to, to thank Kelly, feel free to take yourself off mic or do the old uh, Zoom hands. That's fine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I, hope, I, hope, I hope it was useful. And um, I, I, I just wanted to say, Lysia, you know, more power to, to all of you for what you're doing. And um, I, I wish everybody really well on their political journeys. And I look forward to you know, hearing about all of your great successes. Thank you so much, Kelly. Really appreciate your time and um, your your civic duty that you did for, for basically a decade. So, so thank you for your contribution. Uh, and to everyone else on the call, thank you for joining us um, today. Next month, we're hearing from Kate Thwaites, mm -hmm. uh, Labor MP, recently had a um, her second child in office So, and has just completed a a report on, on um, the internal wranglings of the ALP. Uh, so come and join us for that in a, in a month's time. Uh, and also know that next week we launch our formal masterclass series. This is an inaugural series for us to give you a deep dive into uh, things that you might want to top up on, like media training, how to fundraise, uh, how to understand the maths of your electorate and preferences and so on and so forth. So thank you again, Kelly, and to everyone else on the call. Stay safe, those in lockdown, and we look forward to seeing you on the other side.